Uh, so my name is Dave Hammond, and this is uh, Dr. Luke Donfort. And uh, I, I do lecture demonstrations here at the university, and Luke looks after the teaching labs, and very often we collaborate on stuff, uh, you know, for the demos and uh, at events like this today. So uh, we're going to start off, uh, we've got kind of a varied uh, group of things we're going to cover. Uh, first we're going to talk about buoyancy, and then we're going to move into air pressure, and then electric, some electricity and magnetism. Okay. Uh, feel free to ask questions, uh, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to uh, answer those as best we can. So uh, today, uh, we're gonna, as I said, we're going to start off with the uh, buoyancy. And uh, does anybody know why something sinks or floats? Just curious if anybody has any ideas. Yes. Maybe like density. Density? Density is certainly an important point. Yes. Weight. Weight. Okay. Weight is weight is actually uh, uh, something that, that fits in there as well. Anybody else? Take one more. Okay. So to how, put it, how many how many of you float when you're laying in the lake? How many of you float really well? Wow. Oh. How many of you are sinkers? Yeah, I'm a sinker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a so we know about boys. We've experienced that. Right. And, and some of you, if you has, has anybody ever uh, swum in, in uh, the fresh water and salt water? The ocean and the lake. Anybody notice anything different between fresh and salt? Not float as much? Okay. Well, because of the salt, this, people actually float a little bit more. A little bit more? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, I was going to say the same thing. Um, okay. Yeah, that's that's actually true. It, you, you, I actually can float a lot easier in salt water. It's actually kind of nice. And that's because, uh, somebody mentioned density, the salt water is actually denser than, uh, than fresh water, and we'll, we'll see why that's the case uh, hopefully in a second. So a very uh, simple way of uh, describing why something sinks or floats is that the object that's in the fluid, whether it be water or air, is displacing more than its own weight of that fluid. So right now I'm standing in air, and my body is displacing a certain volume of air, which weighs something. Displacing but, meaning like taking the space up. Right. So you'll notice when you... Uh, if you uh, take a cup of water and you stick your fist in it, say, or whatever, maybe a big cup, the water level goes up. That's because your, your, your hand or whatever you stick in it is taking up volume in the water level. Okay, that's what we mean by, by displacement. Okay? But the weight of air that my body occupies is really not that much compared to what I weigh, so I'm not floating. Okay? But if you use a denser liquid like water, salt water, whatever, you can get conditions where the object you put in that fluid actually displaces more than its own weight and it floats. Okay? That's how blimps work. Okay, those are uh, 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 helium hydrogen blimps. They don't use hydrogen anymore for good reasons. Uh, uh, displace more than their own weight in air. That's why they're super big. They can float. Okay, so first thing I want to demonstrate here is a Cartesian diver. This is a very old device. Uh, was invented, as far as I know, by Rene Descartes, uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, I don't know what his first one looked like, but I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to push down on the cork, and you can see in there's an inverted uh, volumetric flask. The flask is open at the bottom. It's partially filled with water, so it's just enough water in there so it can flow. Okay, so when I push down on the cork, I actually compress some of the air in there, which forces more water in, which effectively changes how much weight of water the, uh, the, the inverted flask is displacing. So in this case, as it comes up, it's now not dis it's displacing less than its own weight in water, so it floats. If I displace more than its weight in water, then it sinks. Okay, I'm, I'm pushing, well, I'm effectively changing the density of the, uh, the uh, flask. And if I get it just right, if I make those two things just equal, I can get neutral buoyancy, kind of. When this is how submarines dive, stay at one uh, depth, and, and rise. They pump water out in and out of the ballast tanks. Okay, any questions there? 
Is that hard to do? Is what hard to do? Making it do up and down? Uh, not really. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes a little bit to uh, to get the right, you know, uh, you got to do a little bit of trial and error. Uh, one thing you can try too is, uh, and I made these, take a, take a, a, a soda bottle, fill it with water, and uh, then you experiment with uh, uh, soy sauce packets or ketchup packets. Those usually have a little bit of air in them, and, but, they're, but they can compress. And so you do this same thing, you cap the bottom, you've got to squeeze real hard on the bottle though. And you can, sometimes you can make one of these out of, out of one of those soy sauce packets. Alright. Okay. So we're going to take uh, what, what we just talked about, and hopefully learn something, and apply it to, to these three scales. And I'm going to ask you a question. And it's always going to be the same question and the answer. And then I'm going to kind of take a poll and see uh, uh, who thinks what's going to happen. And my question is always going to be related to the right side of the scale as you look at it. And the question is be, it's going to be, the questions will be, uh, when I do something to this side of the scale, and I'll tell you what that's going to be, I'm going to ask you, is that side of the scale going to go up, down, or stay the same? Okay. So three simple, three simple answers, up, down, stay the same, okay? This first instance, <clears throat> I have a cup of water on the scale, and it's uh, balanced roughly. And th this side of the scale, those are just counterweights, okay? They're just balancing the scale. I'm going to stick my finger into that cup. And the question is, is that side of the scale going to go up, down, or stay the same? Is your finger still going to be attached to you? Uh, if all goes well, yes. Uh, so okay. you can, I've done this. You can show up, okay. down, so the red power oh. stay the same. And I'll and I'll do a, I'll do a, I'll do a, a hand raising. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I've done this probably uh, 50 times, so I would have run out of fingers okay. a long time ago. And I appreciate the question, though. Well, That's very first. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, Okay. Okay. I'm ready to go. How, I know. I know. How many people think when I stick my finger in the water that's in the cup without touching the cup that that side of the scale is going to go up? Anybody for up? A couple people for up. Okay. How many people think it's going to go down? I was like, wait, wait. Okay. One. But I the was going to go. Slightly less. How many people is going to stay the same? Yes. Okay. You voted twice. He's voted three for every time. Because Margo was eyeing me the whole time. She's like, I'm not sure what to do. I'm just going to vote what the big guy says. <laughs> okay, okay, now I know what's going on. No, and, you know, don't worry about being right or wrong. This is kind of a fun thing. Yeah. And you should know uh, going out that whatever questions we ask you, chances are you will get the right answer more often than most of our students do. Okay, very often these age groups do better than our college students. Okay, so let's do the experiment that is in the cup. What did it do? It went down, okay? Well, let's think about what happened. Like I said before, if you stick something in water, right, you displace water, and the buoyant force, the force on my finger, is equal to the weight of water I displace, and I'm a little too heavy to rise up off the floor. That's not going to happen. So there has to be an added force down on the scale. So that side of the scale goes down. It's, it's I'm kind of thinking through this as if you're leaning into the water and the force is into the water which then pushes the scale down. Is that kind of the right thinking? Yeah, it's essentially if, if, I, if I knew what volume of water my finger displaced and I had a weight laying here that was equal to that and I set it on that side, I'd get the exact same effect. Cool. Okay. Right. Yes? Uh, doesn't like if your finger goes in the water, doesn't the water rise? It did. It did, and, and uh, I didn't really ask that question, but that would have been something else. My finger got wet too. There was a number of things that got happened <laughs> that happened when I did that. But yes, the water went up because there was a displacement, and that's true with anything that's in water. These big ships that you see going by, they displace a lot of water. Well, I got that one wrong. I gotta say. <laughs> There's. Uh, you got two. You got two. You got three. Uh, Okay, next one. This one's a little harder on me. But uh, on this side of the scale that is balanced roughly, I have one of those mylar balloons. 
I'm going to take that mylar balloon off this side of the scale. I'm going to inflate it. Hopefully I will not pass out. One of our professors the other day in class inflated this balloon with just three breaths of air. I'm going to try to tie that. He claims to have one of the largest long volumes uh, that some people have ever seen, so we'll see. Uh, so hopefully I won't pass out. If I pass out, Luke will take over for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to take the balloon out. I'm going to ask you those same three questions. I guess. Yes. What you pull out. Okay. What's that? What's your question? Go ahead. Uh, they were curious. They, they thought that was a, a jar of candy on the uh, It did look a little like candy all wrestled up, but it's, a it's just Dave's it breath. You probably don't want to eat that. Another, all right. So who thinks this side will go up when he puts the inflated balloon back on that side? All right. Uh, there's our up folks. Who thinks this side will stay the same. No, no change. All right? And who expects this side to go down? Just a couple. So most folks think it, it's going to go up. OK. Let's see what and happens. Up, up, all right? So I, 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 got, I had a straw and a balloon that was stuffed in there. So I'm taking the straw, putting it back, so we're getting the same weight. Same uh, amount except, of stuff. Except same amount of stuff. Except this this balloon, uh, I inflated with air. Okay, so I'm going to put that on there. Yeah, if we get it to balance. Okay, and the answer is. What do you see? Uh -huh. Right in the middle. So stay the same. Okay. Stay the now, same. Now we know air weighs something, and I added weight to that side of the scale, but. By adding weight to the other side of the scale, by inflating the balloon, I changed the volume of the balloon, right? It got a lot bigger. So this balloon, just like me standing in the room in air, is feeling a buoyant force. I displaced just as much air as I added. So it's a wash. The added weight of the air on that side of the scale is offset by the buoyant force on the balloon because it's in air, okay? Had I used a stretching rubber balloon, this side would have gone down a little bit because the stretchy rubber balloon actually compact, uh, uh, compresses the air and it doesn't quite work right. Yes? I thought you were going to tie it onto that and then the air in it would So, if we had tied it, would this balloon float up or sink no. down? It's just regular. I mean, Dave's a little full of hot air. Yeah, not that hot. But not. So if we had used hot air that was inside and actively pushing around, we would have gotten a different effect. Okay. Last one. So this side is just a counterweight. Okay. The scale again uh, is balanced. And except on this time, I have the same type of flask, but I have vinegar in the bottom and not water. And I have baking soda in the neck. And the baking soda is being held in the neck by a little ball bearing and a magnet. I'm going to remove the magnet. Yes. And what happens when you make the baking soda with vinegar? Um, it explodes. Well, it doesn't explode. It makes, it makes a gas called. Anybody know what the gas is? Yes. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, exactly. Does carbon dioxide weigh more or less than air? Anybody know? Yeah. It does weigh more, CO2, right? So I'm just throwing that out there. That may be a useful piece of information, it may not. So again, I'm going to inflate this balloon and ask you the same things about that side of the scale. I'm going to get this off the scale because this can get a little exciting. If the balloon flies off. So be thinking about when I put this on the scale, what if anything is going to happen to that side of the scale? Up, down, stay the same. It's going to go down. And be thinking about what we were talking about, about buoyancy, and volume, and things like that. Yeah. Okay, once this stops uh, reacting. We'll put it back on the scale. Okay.
how many people think this side of the scale is going to go up when I put it back on there? One brave soul. Oh, don't wait yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two brave souls. Okay. No, no, how many people no, think no. it's going to go? You retract your vote. Yes. One brave soul. Okay. How many people think it's going to go down? The vast majority of people. How many people think it's going to stay the same? Okay. Now. Hopefully you've learned something about buoyancy, and hopefully you've learned something about democracy and science. Those two things don't really go together, necessarily. Okay, although well, democracy is a good thing. Here we go. Everybody pay attention to this side of the scale. This will amaze you. It moves. You're right. You got it. Yes. Hey, Bobby. Okay. Nice job. So why? Does anybody know why? Why is this staying up? What changed about this side of the scale? Only one thing changed. Somebody who has an answer to the question? Yeah, I think the, the helium in the balloon oh. costs like a little bit less weight. Carbon dioxide. That's carbon dioxide. It weighs more than air. That's why I asked that question. If that were helium, that would be a that would be right, but it's not. I'd say two things change: the um, vinegar and the baking soda reactant. Yeah, yeah, and that's carbon true. Carbon dioxide and the balloon. Oh, no, carbon dioxide. Right. And what was the effect? Of, what, but why did? Why is this side? Uh, apparently lighter. Because all the like heavy carbon dioxide are No. Okay. So the carbon dioxide question is really uh, a, a misleading question. It doesn't matter how much that gas weighs at all, because the elements that we had before are still in there. It's a closed system. Nothing escaped. Nothing entered. The volume changed. The volume changed by. Uh, the volume of that balloon is displacing a certain weight of air right now. So that side, side weighs less by the amount of weight that that volume of air is. And that typically, when I do this, is about a penny. Ta -da. So that volume of air weighs about what a penny weighs. Okay? So we change the volume only. Nothing else mattered in this. Yes, uh, if, excited if, student in the yes, back. If you were to pop the balloon, it would make a bit of a mess, and uh, it would. Uh, it what do we think would happen if we pop the balloon? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and I will arrange for that without popping. <laughs> but but let's let's talk. Do, if we yeah. pop the balloon and then put it back on, up, stay the same, down. Go ahead and vote, and then let's see some downs, let's see some up. Down. We're going to take the penny off. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. All right. Let's call the votes. All right. Everybody ready? Yeah. <laughs> what did it do? Oh. See it went? Oh. It's still up. It's still us. So this side still weighs less. What's your problem? Well, why does it weigh less? Even though the volume. Shifted. We we did some something something happened. Well, because of the baking powder, baking soda that sort of dissolved in this gas, you know, like it sort of uh, let that baking gas, and then now not much. <laughs> well, what happened to the gas? Where did it go? It's not on the scale anymore. It's in the room. I'm breathing it in. So you removed something from the system. Now we lost something from the system. Some of the mass escaped in the form of gas. And that weighs something. In fact, it weighs more than air. Is college always the same amount? Oh, it's terrible. No, no, no. But it's fun. You learn how to think. Learning how to think is actually, a, it takes some effort. Yes. Do you do like these same experiments in college? Well, we do these for our classes. In fact, I did this one Friday. Wow. Uh, Thursday, uh, Wednesday. Sorry, We're getting the same you're stuff. ahead. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what date today. A lot of students are, are not getting this for a couple more years, but you're already getting. And our students didn't do much better as really? far as yes. Or no. so and that's why we do this. Okay. okay, take her away. All right. Can I borrow you for a sec? Can you come here? So I've got a, a hook here, and I, I want you to just pick that up for me. You got it. But was it harder than you expected? Yes. All right, can you stand back here on this side? So I want you to just pull that straight up. <laughs> and what do you notice when you try and pull that up? What's going on? This is like it's sticking to the table. It's sticking to the table. And when did it finally come up? 
when I um, pulled it. I when you pulled it? it? Yeah. Alright, pull it a little bit for me. Well, that was pretty easy. Hey, he's getting, because you just lift it up. He's, he's so getting I just strong. lifted it up. Wow. So pull it again and I won't lift it up this time. What did he have for breakfast this morning? That's what I want. Well, Robin, last time you picked it up just fine. What is your problem? Oh. Is he? Oh. oh. He's getting weaker. Did anyone notice something that was happening when he was lifting it? What did you see over there? It started to slide. And when did it pop up suddenly? It popped up. It's like, like a tiny piece. Oh, which was kind of like when I... Um, it's because the air was released from it, so I... The air was released? Is there air in there right now? No, well, wait, no. The air, there's no can air. You, can you see any air in there? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I meant there's no air. And then so, when he picked up the corner, air was... Oh, he lets... So the air was released into it. Yes. Is that easier? All right, thank you very much. So, so what's going on? The, what's the air doing? So I, we've got air, and the air is, is bouncing around. The air is kind of like a bouncy ball. So the air is just bouncing on this. Who broke my air? Did you break air when I was... What's going on over here? You got two rubber balls, right? So this is not related to air pressure. This is something else entirely. I'm just having fun with. Yes? It's the one that's bouncing has air that's moving around. And this... Wait. And this one's more dense and doesn't have any air. So does it feel more dense? Yeah. And this one has... What do you think? Does that feel more dense? It feels a lot more dense than this one. A lot more dense. All right, what do you think? A lot more dense? What do you think? Which one's denser? All right, a little different here. So this is a... This feels a little different. All right, well, I've been switching them as I hand them from one person oh. to the other, so you guys are disagreeing with each other. So these are both rubber. But rubber can be vulcanized. It's heat treated, which changes how squishy it is. So it's solid rubber. But I just like this because I think it's funny that two things that look similar end up behaving differently. So it's always good to actually do the experiment. Let's go back to the air pressure, though, because we have only a certain amount of time. So there's air bouncing around on the top of this, pushing it down, and there's no air on the other side. And so when he tries to pull it up, it doesn't really come up until he smartly lifted it to the edge of the table or pulls up on one corner. And then it gets really easy. Now, we don't think much about the effect that air can have, but, but there is air there, and what it has and what it does can end up having an effect. So I have a little bit of air inside this tube. These are not toys, these are matches. I'm going to take the head of a match and put it inside the tube. Okay? I don't have the strike plate. There's nothing frictional in there. But now I'm just going to attach this to the top now what does this look like? It looks like a big red button. And what do we like to do with big red buttons? Push them. Right. All right, but in this case, we're not just going to push it. I'm going to push it pretty hard. And it's probably going to happen pretty fast. Dave's going to turn off the light. Make sure you, everybody can see the bottom of that where you're seated, right so above the black area. You're right looking right about here. Okay. And I'm going to turn off the light. Just, just keep looking in that area, okay? okay. Ready? Right under Luke's hand. Now, the only thing in there is air and that match. Yep. Ready? What's left now? A little 
little bit of smoke and is that a fresh mash head? No. So, what happened inside? So, when you push it down, the air got compressed and then it, like, all the molecules and stuff like rubbed against each other and created a heat friction. Then the heat friction and then the mash. So, I, you're saying just by compressing air, I got it hot enough to ignite a match? Uh, just by squeezing it? Well, no, it needs to ignite. Like, it's going to self-combust it because of the air, like, air friction. So as we push things in, it did heat up. The things bounced around, and that made it warm enough. All right. Dave, are you ready for... We will get to that big red button. Oh, yeah. We have to get that by uh, We have to beat that. Okay. So 125. 125. Ah, all right. We'll move a little faster then. Uh, you want to do this? While he's getting that ready, I'll field a couple more questions. We had one there. Um, I was going to say, like, if you're in a pool with water, it's really deep when you go down under. Like, it can, like, it's... Like, you feel rest. squished? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone here ever ridden in a diesel truck? Diesel engines use that same compression. They don't have spark plugs the way gasoline engines can. You have a question? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna wait on that. Oh, but you're gonna miss the big bang if you. So Luke, if we took uh, Sage's idea of swimming and we went deep enough, would we blow up like the match? What is, what is a match really good at doing? Igniting. Igniting. So part of it was we compressed it, that raised the temperature, and then the match head was designed to be inflated. Okay. So it's not designed to go inflate. All right. So now we're going to look at air pressure in a slightly different way. So when you were trying to do air pressure, the air pressure was on the outside, and then when it finally got let in, it made it easier to pick this up. Here we've got a great big tube with air inside of it and a ball at one end. Can everyone see the ball? And there's air outside in the room. We're not going to get rid of that. But we are going to take the air out of the inside of the tube and then we'll open one end of the tube. Ready? Yep. I'm going to start up a vacuum pump. So just like your vacuum cleaner at home, but more powerful, we're sucking, but we're sucking the air out of the inside part of this tube. And there's a thin membrane, a thin film, a thin piece of plastic on both ends of this tube. And when Dave thinks the pressure is low enough, he's going to let the air back in. Now when we suck out over here, we had air pushing. What direction do you think the ball is going to go if we let air in from this side? Go ahead and point with your fingers. Is it going to go that way or that way? So everybody thinks the ball is going to go this way. So on this side, we have an empty soda can. Okay, now this is going to be really loud. I would suggest you stick your fingers in your ear. Watch that end. Watch it. Everybody ready? Come here to watch. Here we go.
the ball went through the kin. So the ball must have been going pretty fast to go all the way through a kin. But what were we pushing it with? All we were pushing it with was air. And I'll leave the ball, Mr. Chandler, you can take the ball home. And you can show the other students at other times. You can see the effect the ball had on the can and the can had on the ball. So that was just the push. You had that push on you all the time. But we don't go flying through the air. Okay. Um, we have that push going against us all the time, but we're also pushed from the other side. It's only when we took the air away that that changed. Can you tell us about how fast that ping pong ball was going to be able to go through a can? Somewhere between 300 and about, about 500. 500, 500 miles per hour. per hour. Right at the end of the, the end of the cannon. Yeah. Wow. All right. And that's, that's something we measured, by the way. That's not yeah. a guess. We're going to transition now to a different set of topics. I'd actually recommend leaving that with Mr. Chandler so you don't get distracted by the next bit. Right. And he can keep it. I so can that use this as my... I coach the ping pong club, and I can use this as my... Hey, I hit the ball so hard. Oh, wicked sir. I, I hit it right through a can. Yeah. That was 500 miles per hour. Perfect. All right. So what I have here, I've got a magnet, a pretty strong magnet. And this magnet is just on a stick, because I like my magnet on a stick, but it gives me a handle so that I can move it in and out of a coil of wire. There's lots and lots and lots of turns of wire, and then it's connected, my coil is connected, to a set of bolts. And if I put the magnet into the coil, what do you notice? Maybe put the put the uh, LEDs up on edge loop or, or do that. There you go. So everybody saw the lights flash? I'll try and get the lights dim enough that you can see. When I go in, the green light comes on. When I come out, the red light goes on. But if I just leave it there, it doesn't light up. It's only when I move the magnet that I get any sort of, of light. So what, what lights up a light bulb? What, what makes a light bulb light up? Electricity. So, just by moving a magnet around, I'm making electricity? So I have a big meter here that can measure, assuming you I have enough Go correctly. off the galvanometer leads, the two in the center. Two in the center, thank yeah. you. So now we can measure the electrical push that I'm using. And I can go in. But what does the needle do? But what happens if you go slow? If I go slow. So that says not a lot of electricity? Not a lot of electrical push, not a lot of electricity there when I went slow. Compared to, now watch when I go fast. Bigger effect, smaller effect. I can't see, you have to tell me. Bigger, Bigger effect. So moving a magnet, what we call a magnetic field, the magnetism around this magnet, moving it in and out of that coil is creating electricity. And when I go in, the needle goes to one side. When I pull it back, the needle goes to the other side. What do you think will happen if I go all the way through? So when I go in, it goes that way. Oh no, it's going to go that It's going to go on the other way. All right, who thinks the needle's going to go that way when I go all the way through? Point that way if you think it's going to go that way. Who thinks the needle's going to go that way? Point that way. All right, we better do the experiment. I see some disagreement. Oh, got it wrong again. So, going in, it went one way, and coming out, it went the other way. Going in, and then coming up, it didn't matter which side it came out on. What does the needle 
represent when it goes in one direction or the other? The electrical push, so sometimes I'm pushing current one way, sometimes I'm pushing current the other direction. So the current is changed based on which way I'm going. And that actually tells us something about the light bulbs that I used. These aren't regular incandescent light bulbs, these are LED light bulbs, which stands for lighting, light emitting diode, and they only light up when current goes one way through them. So they're actually in parallel. And I'm turning them on and turning them off using going in and driving a current, trying to go through both, but only one of them lights up. So we can push a current with a magnetic field. But it's not enough just to have a magnetic field. We have to have a changing magnetic field. And who's ever, who's ever used a computer? And who's been told not to bring a magnet near a computer? Some of you remember that lesson. So we think that, why don't we want to bring a magnet near a computer? What do you think might happen? Might be a bad idea to bring in nearby. Yeah, like the electricity could like go too high or too low. Might push electricity around. It's also true that we use magnets inside of computers to store the memory. So in addition to driving a current that you don't want, you might also change the memory. So how the ups and downs of the magnets in the computer also help the computer remember different things. So we're going to do a different thing now, looking at, we generated a current with a magnetic field, and we can also generate magnetic fields with currents. Let me, let me show that real quick. I'm going to run a current through this coil. The magnet doesn't normally have any effect on that coil, but if I run a current through it, if it can create a magnetic field, what do magnets like to do around each other? Connect, or push apart, or react to each other? Alright, so here's my red button, turning on the current. Now, the current coming out of your wall outlet, is an alternating current. It goes one way and then the other. It goes back and forth. And so the magnetic field that it creates pushes one way and then the other. And so sometimes the magnet just rattles around and it says, I want to get close, I want to get far, I want to get close, I want to get far, I can't decide. So let's, let's use a DC version of this. Where now I have a very, very strong magnet now we have a very good conductor, a very good thing for carrying electricity. And he's going to drop that on there. Everybody watch the magnet. We're going to do that again. What? Uh, can you do it higher? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Is it an opposite? Because it's... Uh, Super strong magnets, and it's the opposite um, well, side of um, this, this is this is not obvious, okay? Over here, remember when uh, Luke was moving the magnet in and out of the coil of wire? He was generating the current, okay? Well, this doesn't look like a coil of wire, but you can think of this as many, many thin layers in which current loops can be generated, okay? Just like we generated a current over there with a changing magnetic field. When I drop this magnet, that's a changing magnetic field. It sets up currents in this copper coil, and just like over there. But it wasn't real obvious over there that, uh, and, and we haven't really talked about it yet, and we probably will. Uh, well, I guess you demonstrated that, didn't you? Uh, when it, whenever you have a, 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 a changing magnetic field that produces a current, that current has its own magnetic field. 
it, it generates its own magnetic field, but it's opposite to the one that produced it in the first place. So this is seeing another magnet when I drop it. Wait, wait, what if pushing you, what back if you this way? Around? And the faster oh, it falls, the other side? Yeah. Good question. Same thing. It's just the current's moving in the other direction to generate the opposite field. Is okay. it touching right now? Yes. This only works when it's moving. Theoretically, I can drop drop this from an arbitrarily high height, and it would still do the same thing. The trick is dropping it flat so I don't hit a corner and chip my expensive magnet. Yes? Oh, what would happen if you, like, dropped it right side up? So right, this way? Yeah. Like, so the magnetic field is really, really strong strong on the big faces, and so there's not that same magnetic push driving the current. Great question. Oh, that's a good one. I can do this. That was not a very good attempt. Okay. I take this and I move it. Do I see the table shaking? And that big heavy plate kind of moving back and forth? But I'm not touching it. The faster I move this, the bigger, the stronger the interaction. The smaller I move it, the weaker the interaction. Okay. All right. So let's come back to currents creating magnetic fields, magnetic fields creating currents. So if I set up, if I run a current through my coil of wire, I create a magnetic field. And that magnetic field can, if it's changing, create currents, which create magnetic fields. So let's first verify that we can create a current. Now what do we use currents for? Electricity to light up light bulbs. So if I'm accurate with my statement, then I should be able to light up a light bulb without even, nothing's touching. But I can get a little bit of light out of that. Now let's, let's try it a little bit different. I have a bunch of rods here. These are iron rods. And what do we know about iron? What does iron think about magnets? Iron. It draws. It draws. Oh, and iron to iron flows. That kind of iron smooths things out. Iron, the metal. Dislikes magnets? Well, if you have a magnet and a bunch of little pieces of iron, where do the little pieces of iron end up? So I have a magnet. I'm going to put a piece of paper on top of the magnet, and then I'm going to sprinkle iron on top of the paper. Have you guys done this? No. Okay. Some of you might have. Where do you think the iron is going to end up? Is it going to stay all over the place? Or... It's going to go towards the magnet. Go towards the magnet, and then kind of point. So iron can channel magnetic fields. So if iron can help us channel a magnetic field, because the magnetic fields run through the iron, what do we think we're going to get for the light now that I have iron to help me run the magnetic field. Brighter, dimmer. Uh, trick questions again. I'm always so bad at this. Brighter, dimmer. Dimmer, brighter. All right, let's do it. Dimmer. I think that was brighter, right? And then let's try it over here again to compare. Uh, all right, so we know that we can generate electricity in a coil. Let's look a little more at the effects of that electricity. So I can make the electricity go around this. This is aluminum. Does aluminum stick to iron? Sorry, does aluminum stick to magnets? Not particularly. So there's no intrinsic magnet here, but I can I can set up a changing magnetic field, which sets up changing currents, which sets up a changing magnetic field. What do we think is going to happen to my aluminum ring if I start running electricity? What's a guess of what might happen? 
Might get hot. Other guesses? The light will be over here, so I'm not, I'm, I'm just asking, do you think anything's going to happen to the ring? Do you think it'll float? Would that be cool? That would be cool. Should we see if it, if it floats? Are you ready? Do that again, I wasn't paying attention. All right, is everybody watching? So we're looking for floating here. Keep on. Whoa. Keep so it made it jump. If I if I leave it on, it jumps off to the side. Does it jump if it's over here? No. So it. Mm. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't seem to like being there. It likes to jump off. All right. Different ring. Two. Two rings. Let's do just one ring first. All right. So this ring has a cut. It has a gap in it. So can the currents flow all the way around this ring? So do we expect this ring to jump? To flip? Alright, turn to the person next to you and tell them what you think it's going to do.
So if a magnetic field creates a current, creates a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is in opposition, if I created a really big magnetic field, really fast, so that there was a lot of change in a short time, we saw that when I did it on one end of the coil, or with the coil on one end of the loop, this jumped. What, what if I could do it right in the middle of, the, of my play? What if I could start a magnetic field right in the middle? What do you think might happen if instead of a thin plate, we use a can, and we're going to start a really strong magnetic field right in the middle? Oh, wait, uh, it's like um, that thing. Because we got to do it now. Cover your ears. I've been charging this up. Cover your ears for sure on this one. So this is going to be loud. And launch, right? Here we go. Ready? flowing itself into the capacitor and then let it all come out. 